Hello everyone, Anthony Metivier here from MagneticMerryMethod.com. I see Mr. Space is in the house. Hello, Mr. Space. If you're joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. We're going to talk today about reading comprehension, strategies to improve reading comprehension, and uh, really how you can use your memory to actually remember more by understanding more and understanding more by remembering more. And so if you're joining us live, let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. Hit that thumbs up and let's get started. Because one of the most obvious, but we know that common sense isn't that common, so we've got to um, point it out. The most obvious strategies and probably the best strategy is to read more often. So, uh, you know, what does that mean, though? What does it mean to read more often? Well, first of all, it means that you would have a number of texts all ready to go. You would have them lined up and have a stack of books that you're going to read, that you want to read, and then you read them based on a schedule, a scheduled reading time. So you put time aside to read. Is that practical every single day of your life? Yes, actually, it is practical because if you don't schedule it, it doesn't get done, right? And you can also measure how you read, and there's a number of ways to measure what you're reading and how you're reading. And uh, one of my recent discoveries uh, that really uh, got a shout out to my friend Adam who pointed it out is a snapshot journal which makes it very very easy to just track your writing over time and this snapshot journal is amazing I'm having a lot of fun with it we'll do a video all about snapshot journals in the future but uh, highly recommend that but there's all kinds of journals you can get this is the mastery journal that I use a lot and really like a lot and uh, the freedom journal as well but you can schedule it and track it and then actually improve over time because, you know, if you're able to put in 15 minutes, then you can put in 16 minutes the next day. So long as you uh, have a sense that you actually put in 15 minutes and you can make little notes of the big points that were in there for you. So let me check in with the chat. Mr. Space says, I hate reading. I think I don't have time for it. Well, do you hate it or do you not have time for it? Which is it? Let's pick one. Thanks for being here. Um, Chanel is in the house. Good to see you, Chanel. Uh, Reclaiming Life is here from south of Buffalo, New York. Awesome. Always good to see you. Chanukya is here from India. Namaste. Adonis from Arizona. Well, hello in Arizona. I've never been to Arizona. I want to get to Arizona. Buffalo, I, I've been to, but um, Arizona not. And India, I've never been to, so we're waiting for the, introduction, uh, the invitation. Mr. Space is in Queens. Queens I've been to, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> All right, so thanks everyone for being here. If you're just joining us, hit that thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. And uh, if you had to rate your reading comprehension from one to five, where would it be? One is like a meh and uh, five is magnetic. I'd be curious where you would rate your reading comprehension. What is reading comprehension anyway, right? Well. For one thing, it's just the ability to understand what you read. But what does it mean to understand what you read? It's basically the ability to connect, right? To comprehend through connection because you are snapping things into place and you're making a bigger picture in your mind than the one that you had before. Or you're supplementing it. But nothing can be comprehended if, it, if there isn't a change going on, right? Uh, you can think of it as a chemical change. When you put bread into a toaster, right, then you change it to bread and it never changes back. That's what comprehension is, right? You have been chemically changed and you're not going back. And so if you're not really engaged with the text, then, you know, you're not really comprehending it because a change must occur. It must. That's my, that's my personal definition of comprehension. So let's check in with the chat. Chanel's at five. Wow, amazing. Uh, Mr. Space at three. Maybe that has to do with your hatred of reading. <laughs> but uh, tell me more about that. Chanukya is at one or two. Daniel's at a five. And Reclaiming Life is four plus. Awesome, awesome. Great, great, great. Mr. Space is, says Arizona is too hot. Maybe that's, that's part of the... Uh, the problem, because heat can interfere with your ability to concentrate, and concentration and focus is part of comprehension, right? Daniel says reading is comprehension is five, retention two or three. All right, so that's a good question there, Daniel. If you 
don't retain it, have you comprehended it? Ponder on that. Reclaiming Life says, depending on the language, of course, indeed, indeed. Yeah, so that's a good point as well. Um, especially when you have a language that uses a lot of riddles and puns and, you know, four word phrases that are from ancient times uh, rather than straightforward stuff that sorry languages like German and English tend to do, whereas there are some very flowery, ornate languages where they would just spin around and around and around. And, you know, you can think of, of the, the languages and also just even in English, they're very, very uh, ornate, um, ornate uh, ways of using English um, and particularly there's a problem in a lot of philosophy where they translate from these flowery, ornate languages, and then they basically go for the logopoia, as it's called, and um, they, then you try to read them in English, and it's just like, what the heck is this? It just doesn't come across quite uh, quite uh, proper. Chula, thanks for being here. Good to see you. Not sure why you can't hear, but uh, maybe A-OK -okay means that you got it back. Harvinder is in the house. Namaste. Bonjour. Comment ça va? All right, love to see you online as well. So that's awesome. So anyway, comprehension, I say, means you have a chemical change because you have remembered it and you actually have connected it with information that you either already knew or you're knowing in real time, and it expands your picture of the world. And so part of that means that you know who the author is. You know, you know what the date of the book is, when it was published. Like that's part of comprehension, right? Being able to fit it in history, in the history of the publishing house, in the history of the author's oeuvre, in the history of the ideas that they are responding to, etc., etc. So this is really, really important that comprehension is not just, yeah, I read this and I understood it. It's like, did you understand it historically? Did you understand it in ways that are a little deeper than just... Yeah, I get the gist of it, right? Because understanding is comprehensive. Understanding includes the text and the paratext, right? What is paratext? Paratext is all the text that surrounds the text. And I use that term in different ways. Got that from Gerard Jeannette, who has a whole book called Paratext. And I highly recommend that you read it because it's brilliant. All right. So uh, Riho says one and two. Great, great. If you haven't popped in your reading comprehension level yet, please go ahead and do so. We've got a bunch of answers already, which I really appreciate. If you're joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking, and how would you rate your reading comprehension from one to five? One being meh, and five being magnetic. And magnetic means what we just said. So if you need to change your number, go ahead and change it now, uh, because it means you know the date of the book, you know the author of the book, you probably know the publisher because that would be really useful as well. And why? Well, first of all, it gives you lots of memory tools, right? Because if you think of the date of a book, you can think of all the movies you saw that year or the movies that you're aware of that came out that year, which gives you all kinds of memory tools like crazy, right? And uh, you want that stuff. So that's what five means. And we had some fives before. So if you need to change that, Go ahead and change it. Um, and it also means always having a chemical change, always connecting with the material to the point that it changes you because you now learn new things. It's not just passive understanding, it's active understanding, which is what comprehension is all about. So first strategy, like we said, just read more often. I know that's just common sense, but it actually not only needs to be pointed out because common sense isn't so common, but it needs to be pointed out because people aren't actively reading. They aren't reading for comprehension often enough. And that's been historically true. And we can all blame Pew News, right? Let's blame Pew News because <laughs> it's just too damn entertaining sometimes to watch videos instead of <laughs> reading. Mr. Space says that... Uh, He's never thought this way. Well, that's why we do these live streams, because we want you thinking in new ways, expanding your thought, and then comprehending how you think before, after, during, and you know, growing over time. And uh, what I love about this work that I do is sometimes I'm blessed that a lot of you challenge me, which is really great to grow. And that's wonderful, wonderful. So keep that coming. 
All right, James is in the house. Good to see you, James. How are things going? Your reading comprehension is 3.5. Well, good evening to you as well. All right, so we read more often, we schedule reading time, and then we maybe just track our reading and, you know, keep note of stuff. I like this snapshot journal. I've been keeping note ever since I got it, what's going on, and uh, really enjoy reading a lot. And look, I like to challenge myself too. That, that That's the thing about reading more often is read more often and read more challenging things. So one of the things with my Sanskrit project, when I first started, I was just like, huh, what the heck is all this avidya stuff and all these Sanskrit terms that just keep coming up? And then they use the same Sanskrit term like 45 different ways. And, you know, it's a challenge. And one of the things that I knew was not to give up. Just keep reading and reading and reading. And some of the things that we'll talk about today, keep on doing all those things and just keep going and going and going and going. But don't give up because reading more of it more often is a great comprehension strategy. It is the kingpin strategy, right? So a lot of people, they just look at something and they're like, Bleh, and they give up. No, no, no. And a thousand times, no, you got to persist. You got to keep reading and read more often and schedule it and then track it. Now, what is USSR? That's what we used to use in school which is uninterrupted, sustained, silent reading. And uh, why would we want it to be uninterrupted? Well, because reading in an uninterrupted manner is a very, very good way to have focus, to have concentration, to also allow your mind to drift a little bit and then bring it back. That's a skill. Your mind is going to wander. Minds wander. That's what they do. And uh, in order to embrace that, you want to be uninterrupted in the state of being interrupted if your mind is going to wander so you can better train it to come back, right? So being uninterrupted is very, very important. Silence. Well, I've been doing some experiments recently because I remember when I was a kid, I used to listen to music and read all the time and I never had an issue with this. So I've been doing some experiments to see if I can revive that and to a certain extent I can. It depends on the nature of the music. But generally, silence is great. But yesterday we were uh, hanging around and, you know, my, my wife goes into stores to look at the latest fashions, <laughs> which I have zero interest. So I sit on a bench and read. And there's all kinds of sounds going on, street musician, doo -doo 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 -doo. and uh, I have no problem reading while those sounds are going on. So silence doesn't necessarily mean silence. And one of the great things about meditation is that you, uh, you can actually find silence in noise in the midst of a storm. So that's great. Sustained, right? Well, sustained means that you're going to actually stick with your reading for a certain period of time. So you can sustain it by having a numerical goal of how many minutes you're going to read for. You can sustain it by having a goal of a number of pages that you're going to read for. Heck, it can be number of paragraphs or sentences or even words. That's up to you, but sustain it. Actually have a goal of how much you're going to read. And really, really sustain that through the silence of an uninterrupted space. And then R, of course, is for reading, as uh, you can imagine. <laughs> I don't, I never heard that one before, Mr. Space, but uh, sounds fascinating. Chanel says right now she's 112 pages away from finishing the first Hunger, Game, Hunger Games book in Italian. Excellent, excellent. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. All right, so this is just the, the beginning of what we're going to talk about today. But I want to point out that we have a webinar coming up in not so many hours from now. And you can go and get that. Jonathan Levy and I, for the first time in many years, on a webinar together, at least for uh, accelerated learning. That's at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash SRF. If you're already registered, then there's nothing to do. But I thought I'd give you all another opportunity to join us at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash SRF and we'll really hope to see you there. I do not know why that weird little face shows up, but uh, it's kind of cool <laughs> in its way. But that's supposed to be a colon, so that's the uh, the new colon. Anyway, you can click that link, get uh, registered. I'll show you more about it later. All right, Mr. Space says, can you please tell what USSR stands for when it comes to reading? I just did, but for you, I will repeat it. Uninterrupted, sustained, silent reading. Are you driving? <laughs> Uh, all right. So I also wanted to share this with you because this is a wonderful, nice uh, testimonial received recently from Ren Slocum. And she took the masterclass and 
told me that she is able to sail through tests and exams now, which is excellent, which suggests that she probably comprehends some of that material here. But I wanted to raise this point because there's something very, very key here, which is that in addition to the other wonderful things that she points out by surprising herself that she enjoyed the exercises in the Magnetic Mary Method Masterclass, she was able to do well in them. And then that her, she said her self-image of having a lousy memory is improving. And this is part of reading comprehension. If you have this self-image that is not honoring you and nurturing you and supporting you, then that's going to be a barrier between you and comprehending your reading. So improving your self-image is always what memory improvement is about because you'll feel laser sharp and you'll just have more confidence. That's what happened to me when I was super depressed and, you know, thinking of dropping out of grad school and worse. And uh, I had no self-image. My, my self-image was was destroyed, as uh, YouTube videos often like to say. And I just uh, had this wonderful lift in confidence and feeling great. So she says, I had to take a memory test as part of an insurance application. I put my memory palace to work and sailed through it. So if a poor memory is causing you problems, this course will give you the tools to conquer the problems. Excellent. So that's a great outcome. But the most important outcome of all is a better self-image. Isn't that great? I think that's wonderful. All right. So let's carry on with some more strategies to improve reading comprehension. So if you're just joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. And one of the great strategies is knowing your best time of day. And I really started to think of time of day uh, after reading Rest by Alex Pang. And uh, what a great book that is. It really gets into the science. And not everybody's time of day is, is, is the same. And not even your time is the same every single day. But if you study your time of day and you really think it through and start to analyze when you're sharpest, then you're able to uh, maybe harness that and use that for your reading. Now, it's not just time of day, though. There's also some interesting uh, research that shows that time of week can matter as well. So the beginning of the week for some people is incredibly filled with energy for the biggest things. But that's often where they spend their time on the most you know, minor little details that they need to catch up on from the weekend. But maybe that's better left to the end of the week when their creative and mental energy has been depleted uh, and they can really, really benefit from, you know, doing all those little tasks at the end of the week when they don't need to have so much creative power, so much focus and concentration. So I thought that was a very, very interesting finding. Um, and... Uh, one of the things that's so great about thinking that through and putting it into practice is that it can really, really help your reading comprehension when you have your best energy for the most difficult te uh, texts and you've really, really aligned your time in accordance to that. Now, another strategy is to read aloud. And one of the great things about reading aloud is that you're dual processing. Now, this doesn't work for everybody, but it works for a lot of people. And I really highly recommend it. When I went through my deepest, darkest depressions, that's what I did, read aloud. And reading aloud really, really helped me get through the text because, you know, you can talk all day about having goals and how many pages you're going to get through and so forth. But if you can't focus, you can't concentrate, and you're on pills like I was, whoa, you know. Um, reading out loud saved my skin in many ways, in addition to the memory techniques. So reading out loud is a, is a great way. Now, you don't have to do it through everything, but when you get caught on something, you know, what does that mean? Reading it out loud can really, really get it through a different processing center that helps you see it from a different angle. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, another thing is you can record your own audiobooks if you don't have them. So there were some dense, difficult French articles, for example, uh, from the French philosophical tradition, and I couldn't wrap my head around it in writing. So I, I recorded it and listened to it, and then I read it with my own voice reading it. it takes a bit of time, but worth it when you really need to understand it, when you really need to get it. So you can record your own audiobook. Back then, had to use like cassettes and stuff. But uh, <laughs> these days, you can just simply talk into your phone. Amazing. Mr. Space says, my English teacher used to force us to read out loud. 
reading aloud says, William also helps you train yourself to be a better speaker. Yes, that's right. And it is a skill because it involves your muscle memory of your mouth. And there's so much to the brain muscle connection that you really want to dig into that and really explore it and, you know, think about it more. And on the matter of reading out loud, you got to protect your, 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 your mouth, right? So do some warm up exercises. Um, uh, Jonathan and I actually have some mouth warm up exercises that we have shared in a course that we put together. Um, back in the day. So you can check that out sometime if you're interested. That was Branding You Academy. But we're going to do some speed reading fundamentals. So make sure you join us on that webinar at magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash SRF. In any case, recording your own audiobook is great. Now there's another strategy, which is rereading. And it's actually one of the most popular uh, blog posts and podcasts that I ever put out on the site. Like I'm not into, I don't really care about vanity metrics and so forth, but I pay attention to what people like and look at that 217 shares. So if you missed the 11 reasons you should reread at least one book every month, you got to go check that out. The link is in the description below and share it around because, uh, that will, uh, obviously, help more people find it and tell the robots that humans care about this knowledge. Um, but rereading is really, really important. And if you can put it into a actual sort of rhythm when you're going to reread, so you schedule your first read, you schedule your follow-up read, this is a very, very good strategy. Um, and obviously, rereading at least one book every month is something that's so doable for everybody. So I highly recommend that you you get in there and do that and make it happen. And there's a whole resource about the 11 reasons you should reread a book once a month. And I hope that you do take up that habit. It'll really, really uh, make things much, much better for you. And, you know, when you can read faster, that makes it so much easier to reread books. Um, so if you haven't already gone over to magneticmarymethod.com forward slash SRF, go check that out. All you're going to do is see a little screen like this and click that register now button. Then you get a screen like uh, that and it's going to uh, ask you for your uh, information so we know where to send your invitation for the webinar at magneticmarymethod.com forward slash SRF and hope to see you there. All right. So strategies to improve. I got some more. I got some more. And uh, William says, rereading is a topic that comes up fairly often on reading and rereading. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is such a huge thing. On top of scheduling, rereading, and scheduling your rereading is huge. And you know what? Here's the thing. It's not really about repetition. It's not really about repetition. It's about actually catching the stuff that you didn't get the first time. So obviously the repetition helps, it matters. It's very good to, to um, have strategic, creative repetition. But this is more about what did you miss the first time? Because you'll be amazed if you don't do this by how much you missed. You'll also have an effect, especially when you do this over many years, you'll just think, wow, this is a completely different thing than I remembered, right? Because we distort things over time, uh, a lot of things, not everything. But a number of the things that we think we remember, we've distorted them. And then going back and rereading really is a, a is a experience of confronting your memory that is not to be missed. And you, you, you fill in a lot of blanks and gaps that you missed the first time, but you also have this experience of your own memory and how how odd and strange it is. And you just have this opportunity to crystallize what you did remember before and have it, you know, in your in your brain bath grow. Those vines, those dendritic spines that grow just get stronger and stronger. And you can feel it happening. You can feel the connections deepen and deepen. And then you have 
the opportunity to make even more connections because there's a gap between when you first read the text and then when you go and reread the text and you have now all the knowledge in between. You have all the stuff that you've accumulated from read one to read two and now you can fill in, like it's not just about filling in gaps, but it's actually having more cement, you know, or, or sticky material to which more connections can can create uh, can be created. So this is a this is about memory reserve because we build up memory reserve over time, and as we continue to read and then reread, then we are able to have a lot more connections because we have more connections with which to build and connect. So this is really really important. And you know, just an example with the Sanskrit project, I go back and reread some of the first books that I read about Advaita Vedanta and the, all of this this tradition. Um, and it's just like, wow, like that all, I can't believe that, you know, this didn't make sense to me before. Now it's totally clicking and I'm able to connect it with the material that I've read since at a much deeper level. So Mr. Space says, do you do yourself all this effects on live streaming? I don't know what you mean by, do I do all these effects on live streaming? If you mean like the outer space background and the, your words appearing here and this, well, I do the outer space background. Well, not really myself, because there's a software that does it, and there's graphics that I didn't create, but I found, and uh, and there's fonts and stuff that Google provides, and there's colors that the world created, and then this here, um, Ali, the video editor at magneticmerrymethod.com, created for us. And uh, we had to talk with each other to like size it properly inside of this software. So is that what you mean by effects? If so, let me know if that answers your question. Thank you for asking. Thank you for noticing. A lot of work goes into this stuff. And um, it's a, a great, great investment in time and energy because it helps keep away the evil doctor forget. He's always there waiting because <laughs> you can forget how to actually uh, do this kind of uh, stuff. And you forget to continue to improve. And if you have suggestions, let me know if this doesn't look all that great. I don't know why my hand disappears. Tried to fix that, but it does. In any case, it's all very complex. And uh, I don't know the extent to which that it actually, I mean, people say, hey man, amazing stuff, great. But I don't know how much this cosmetic stuff actually helps you improve your memory or not. That will be interesting to see over time. Um, but uh, Information display is something that I've thought a lot about and all the more so since Carolyn Coslo brought it up. She and I recorded a video. She was talking a lot about information display. If you're with us now, hello, Carolyn. If, if not, see you on the, on the replay. But thank you for that chat that we had. And it's all in process now in production. Um, a lot of things, you know, the more that you want to do things and get them right and so forth. Ali and I, sometimes we go through videos two, three, four times and, uh, then we get them up there. Seems like people like it. So that's great. William says, it's not just distortion, but viewing and understanding from a different point in your life with more different experiences. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Um, experience too. It's not just what you've read. It's also what you've experienced and you can make so many connections. That's another reason too, why going to meet people whenever you can go to live talks, whenever you can, it also gives you more to connect with, more to change with. Like when I went to uh, Jordan Peterson here and got my little VIP badge, woo, met him. Like that changes a lot because there's a difference between watching a guy on YouTube all the time and then spending some time, right? Shaking a hand, looking him eye to eye. That changes a lot in your brain chemistry and it makes you look at everything differently. Even though, I, I you know, I, I, I had a pretty... Uh, healthy understanding of what's going on there. It changes things. That's why in university, I'm so glad I met Umberto Eco, shook his hand, you know, and uh, that was, that just changed so much. And even just my professors, like being able to go to their office hours, talk to them. I had some pretty cool professors. And then going to grad school, you get to work closer with the professors. So like Nikita Larry was the supervisor of my first MA. That was amazing. Like, unbelievable the time that, that we spent and you know the 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 meetings later uh, we would go to visit him and same thing with um with jamie scott who supervised my dissertation 
that was amazing. And, and wow, they, there's just so many amazing things that uh, happen when you go and meet people and you add to your pool of experience and you spend time with them. Uh, even just a little bit of time. And the people who were on my graduate committee, unbelievable. I was so, so honored to have, like, Derek Cohen was on my graduate, uh, or about, on my dissertation defense. He wasn't on my grad committee. Matthew Clark was on my math, uh, my graduate committee and so forth. Like, unbelievable people. They're not, like, international figures, some some of them, but amazing, amazing, wonderful. All right, and the, the point is, is it helps with your reading comprehension to spend time with these people to spend time with them. It's a, it's a bit of a shame that universities are going the way that they're going. Um, but even so, if you could find like really, really great people, oh man, like I'm just now having so many memories, European graduate school, studying with Geert Lovink, for example, um, and Hendrik Speck. Whoa, those were amazing classrooms to be in. Slavoj Žižek, amazing classroom to be in. Having lunch with Peter Greenaway, amazing. <laughs> it just changes your brain. You pay attention to things so much deeper. So go and meet people. So I'm just really riffing on uh, Reclaiming Life's comment and how much life experiences help when you reread books with your comprehension. Mr. Space says, it does help. Unorganized list with header and displayed comment section. I think it's way better than you just talking. It's very informative and interactive. Great. Thanks for that feedback. And, uh, Really appreciate that. Um, we'll keep doing it. And if you're just joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking, and what any questions that you have whatsoever. We've been having a great discussion so far with some people in the chat, Mr. Space and Reclaiming Life. And I think I uh, saw some other people here before. Uh, I think James was here. I don't know if he's still here. Harvinder was here. Daniel, if you're just joining us. Say hello. Let's have a chat. All right. So the other thing is pre-reading and priming. Now we talked about pre-reading a lot before and we talked about priming. It's very, very simple, easy, effective to do. And it is really helping. It, it, it basically helps you study the structure of the book and it helps you activate existing knowledge because when you go through a book and you look through the index, you're like, oh, it's going to talk about this and oh that's going to come up or oh i don't know what that is and or i i think i've heard that before like it's amazing so so many books you know you look through the index and you're just starting to set up signposts you're starting to have this recognition highway you know it, 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 you're 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 going to just jump on that stuff when it comes up in the text and you're activating your existing knowledge while you study the structure. Very, very powerful. It only takes a few minutes to do. And you don't have to do it just at the beginning. You can do it while you're reading multiple times. I constantly go back and, and look through that and go back and look through the, like the table of contents and so forth. So very, very powerful method of improving your reading comprehension. James is still here. Good. Excellent. Thank you. Um, if you're joining us, let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing. You can always uh, participate in the replay in the discussion below as well. I always appreciate that. And we can pick up any questions that you may have. All right. So here's some more really cool strategies that uh, you might already do some of these naturally, but you can trigger and remind yourself to do them more often. So try to think ahead when you're reading Assuming you've done all the, the pre-reading stuff and priming, if you have any questions about that and want to go deeper into that topic, let me know. But assuming that you've done all that, as you're reading, think ahead. Anticipate the meaning that's coming. Now, if you're doing your priming properly, you're going to have a great deal of insight in that already from having read the index, having read the conclusion first instead of last, having read the introduction, having read some of the chapters that jumped out at you first, making sure you know the table of contents, the call upon page, all that stuff. You're going to already be thinking ahead, but then continue to think ahead and note where you have confirmation of what you thought was coming and note where you didn't, right? Uh, and also just knowing the purpose of the text. It's a very, very powerful strategy, right? Because sometimes you won't know the purpose. You, you'll, you'll be wondering, like, what is this all about? Um, it often happens that 
you're 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 not clear you don't have a goal you don't have a purpose in mind but if you know the purpose the author had for you then that helps you anticipate the meaning throughout your reading also another thing is pay attention to what is not clear both to you and to the author cuz authors will often say this still isn't clear or we don't know yet why this would be really pay attention to that stuff and make a note of it make a mental note make a note on paper and so forth and also, try to think ahead and anticipate the meaning where what isn't clear is going to either create issues or create opportunities, right? Because if you ever go to grad school and you do graduate work, then one of the things that you're going to want to do is seize upon those opportunities to make clear what currently isn't clear, to see what kind of insights that you can bring, which I hope everybody does. Uh, whether they go to grad school or not. That's what that's what authors do. And that's that's what keeps the human knowledge engine rolling, right? Sometimes people don't do enough research and they don't realize that they're treading territory that has already been treaded, but that's fine. That's okay. That author hasn't hasn't been there. And uh, sometimes, you know, you, you need to write books that expose your own ignorance to yourself. Um, that's partly what a dissertation is, right? Uh, and early, long before I wrote the dissertation, in one of my field exams, I remember saying, well, there are no books on this or whatever, and no one's tackled this yet. And one of the people on my committee, it was probably Jamie Scott, might have been somebody else, said, don't ever say that. You don't know that. And any time that you say no one has ever talked about this before, stop yourself because it's almost certainly not true. And even if it were, don't say it, you know, just say something more like to date, I have not been able to discover anything. And then the people reading you will maybe get in touch with you and say, Hey, you know, maybe you should read this. But if you, and you see it in academic writing all the time, you see it in dissertations all the time. It's just like, no one has ever tackled this before. No, probably not. <laughs> so I was glad that, I, that uh, I was given that modesty lesson early on in grad school. Grim Rank is in the house. Hello, Grim Rank. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. So those are all tips for you, and they'll help with your reading comprehension and pave the path for future work that you yourself might do. Uh, not necessarily that you become a writer, but future reading that you might do. Right? When you're paying attention to what is not clear, then you have a picture in your mind of what you might search for to read next. Because the author might not have any suggestions next <laughs> what to read. And you could crystallize that for yourself and use the power of search to find that. All right, Mr. Space says, my purpose is to be able to remember things easily. And most of the time, I'm afraid that I'm not able to remember keywords or meanings. When I read a book, I always think if I will be able to remember. Well, have you taken the free course, Mr. Space, and learned how to use a memory palace and memorize some of those keywords and their meanings? If not, I recommend that you do because you can put that fear completely aside. You do not have to have that fear. If that fear keeps coming to your mind, that is a, a distraction from focusing on what you need to be doing. And what you need to be doing is focusing on the meaning, not the fear of whether you're going to remember it or not, right? And so one of the things that you want to do is have those skills as soon as possible. So please avail yourself and train yourself and get them so that you can put that fear aside. Put that fear aside. It, it, is, a, it is an unnecessary deviation from reading uh, when anybody can improve their memory and be able to remember either many things in real time or things that they have strategized using the methods I teach to actually capture that knowledge in the most effective ways and then encode it into memory palaces and then use the memory palaces to get it into long-term memory so that when you're rereading and then when you're reading other books, you actually have this, what I call the rhizomatic effect of just connections firing off all the time, unbelievable connections. And then that reading, you know, becomes joyful because you're constantly connecting in your mind and you're constantly cross-indexing things and just in this wonderful matrix of knowledge that's blossoming as you read to the point that you're just like, wow, I can't wait to sit down and read some more. <laughs> it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So thanks for sharing that. But um, 
If your purpose is to be able to remember things easily, then the task before the task is to put yourself in that position through training. And that training is available. Ah, there it is right there. Free memory kit. Go and get it. And if you are joining us, make sure you go and get that as well. All right. Another strategy for you. Reflect on meaning. Reflect on meaning. It's something that people don't do enough. They don't reflect on what they've read. How do you do it? Well, one of the best ways is to have memorized some key points, some key words that you have there, and uh, actually revisit it on a, on a pattern, which you know is, is called recall rehearsal. And as you do that, no, don't just trigger off the semantic information or the structural information and its, its core meaning, but actually reflect on it. What does reflecting on it mean? Well, what does it connect to? Who's it important to? Why is it important to them? How exactly is its importance played out in that context? How is it played out in other contexts? What are the consequences of it not being played out in other contexts? And so forth. Reflect on its meaning. So, for example, you have something like, uh, I don't know, a, a software like WeChat in China. How is that its importance played out globally outside of China. How is it important inside of China and so forth? And you read an article about it and then you start to think comparatively with Facebook Messenger, etc. I'm just riffing something off the top of my head that I read recently. But then later, going and reflecting. And there's many, many ways to reflect, which we'll talk about in a while here. But um, reflecting on meaning is very, very important. And uh, discussing is really, really important as well. So, you know, some of the things that you want to do are have discussion partners, have people that you talk to, have uh, internet sites where you can discuss on a blog, have uh, YouTube live streams where you can discuss with people who are, you know, related to your topic. And if not, live stream yourself to discuss and you'll grow an audience and have many, many people to, um, to discuss with. Another way to comprehend better is to apply the knowledge. So... Not everything is applicable, you know, in your practice, although you'd be surprised it's applicable far more often than, than one would think, uh, especially when you understand that reflecting on meaning is its application. Um, so you can apply pretty much everything, if it's even if it's only just in terms of application. All right, so that uh, is that. Let's carry on. Uh, accountability is really, really important. There's three different kinds of accountability. I talk about those kinds of accountability in a book called The Memory Connection. If you don't have it yet, there's still some print copies available. And uh, eventually, I will re release the, the fire sale. So if you want to get one before the, the fire sale goes on, make sure that you do. And uh, it talks about three levels of accountability and you'll really, really benefit from them. Also, having some sort of reading group can be very, very powerful. This has maybe got some accountability factored into it um, or not, but one of the great things here in Brisbane is there's a, there's a reading group that, that I go to about half the meetings, and uh, it's really, really great. There's no accountability in it. N nobody uh, has, a, has a little thing that checks off whether you read the chapter or not. It's just to discuss... The, the main topic of the chapter of a book that has been read leading up to that meeting. It's fantastic. You hear what other people think. You hear what they don't think. Um, you hear yourself saying what you think, which is a great way of actually testing your knowledge of what you think you think. And, uh, you know, you actually refine it through the practice of discussing it. Reading groups are very, very good. And then, of course, I already mentioned... Um, Comprehending more by tracking things in a journal. I'm really enjoying this snapshot journal. It's not really got space for big ideas or anything like that, but it's just tracking where you're at, how many chapters you read, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and uh, making little little connections. Very, very wonderful. Great, great. Mr. Space says, "If I'm, if ever I'm popular, you will be credited." <laughs> oh, great. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I appreciate that. And um, yeah, we always got to. Uh, credit, give credit where it's due, that's for sure. Um, which is why when I mentioned this snapshot journal, I said I got to give credit to my friend Adam for for uh, sharing that out. 
mentioning it. And that was actually not in a reading group, but um, in a in like a little business strategy group. And we help each other think things through. And that that's always good. Always good to have these things because it changes the chemicals in your brain. It's actually very healthy for your brain. And speaking of, you know, meetings and groups, if you want to join us for our webinar that's happening in not so long from now, go to magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash SRF, that's Speed Reading Foundations and Fundamentals with Jonathan Levy. And uh, you don't want to miss this. This is going to be fantastic. The two of us in the same presentation space. Whoa. We're going to have a good old time. Oh, right. Carrying on. Other strategies to help improve reading comprehension. Read and print with an audiobook. So when I had my Great Depression, not great in the sense of good, but the massive depression in university, wow, <laughs> it would have been so great to have audible.com back then, but we didn't have that. And um, there was a dearth of audiobooks, but I could find them some of the time. So I remember I had to read James Joyce's Ulysses. There was no way in that medical state crippled by all these uh, drugs that I was on. But with the power of audiobooks, I was able to find one that was uh, for, it was an old cassette uh, version, and it was not, not really a great narrator, and it had been for people with um, visual impairment. So that was great, though. I was able to get through it. I was able to get through it. And if you don't know James Joyce's Ulysses, it's big. And it's got a lot of literary flair. And it can be a bit difficult to track what's going on and to whom it's happening and so forth. And yeah, I got through it. And I remember closing the last page and saying, I know modernism. And, you know, I didn't have that much of a trouble reading other modernists, uh, but he, he was he was tough. He was tough. Or that book in particular was just tough. And it, it's not, I don't know how it would look if I went and tried to read it again, but it was particularly bad part of this depression. So when I say it was tough, it was tough for me at that time in that context. So reading it with an audiobook in front of uh, actually seeing it. Now, there were variations. It wasn't exactly the same text that they were reading, and there are multiple versions of, of many books. Um, and back then, when I was using this technique, when I was able to get audiobooks, you would sometimes have like an American version of the book, but uh, an English edit of the audiobook, and there would be variations. Crime and Punishment. I remember reading Crime and Punishment from Ballantine, uh, the publisher, and then listening to a British production of it, and you just have to correct it as you go along. It's just minor little things, but nonetheless, um, you have to do that. And in, in a way, it actually made it easier to pay attention. It made it easier to to focus on on the text at hand. And what a great book, too. What a great book. But you really got to make sure you have an unexpurgated version of it. All right, so reading print with an audiobook is a strategy. Pausing to question is part of reflecting, but um, reflection is usually something you do afterwards. But pausing to question is very, very important. And uh, using the Feynman technique. So we're going to go through the Feynman technique uh, very briefly here. But first, I want to invite you to go to magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash SRF and uh, join us for learn anything three times faster using neuroscience-based methods that actually work. Then when you click on this little button here, register now, you're going to get this uh, register to this event, and we'll see you there. It's going to be great. Now, in terms of the Feynman technique, I've uh, changed it a fair amount, but uh, one of the things that you do is you get out a blank piece of paper, you write the name of the concept, on the top of the piece of paper, and then you write out what you do understand of the concept and put what you feel you don't understand in your own words and literally put what I still don't get is and put as much on that piece of paper as you possibly can and then go take a walk, shower, meditate, etc. That's not just uh, because it's nice to do. It actually helps with creating diffusion in your brain and you'll have these aha moments out of nowhere. They're amazing. Uh, and it just works 
basically because when your brain is so focused and compressed it is it's not free it's it's not really connecting the dots in a way that it will when you just release some of that pressure and then you have these aha moments and epiphanies that are very very good um, and you get those from walking and hot showers and meditation then after you do that come back review your reading or sorry review you know um, your, your reading of the book without looking at what you wrote there about what you didn't understand you can come back to that after um, but really really look at what it was in the text itself that you didn't understand that's a very, very powerful way of coming back at it. Because often when you go for a walk, have a shower, etc., you'll have this epiphany, you'll solve it, but then check that you've actually solved it. Then um, come back to what you wrote and see if you can spot errors in what you understood and fill any gaps that you have. And then, you know, if you have a study group, take everything to your study group. That's an amazing, amazing thing to do. And of course, one of the things to do is... Um, Take whatever you know to our webinar, which is, again, taking place here. You can learn anything faster. Go to magneticbrainmethod.com forward slash SRF, join up, put your information there, and uh, we'll get some more strategies coming for you in a second. And uh, really, really excited to see everybody on this webinar. You can change your time zone by clicking on this area here and... Um, yeah, just enter that stuff and that way we know where to send you your access when the webinar goes live. It's going to be great. We're going to cover speed reading. We're going to cover memory, all kinds of wonderful things. So you can be there. And uh, Mr. Space says he just reg registered in the webinar. Excellent. Sean is here. Thanks for being here, Sean. Checking in from New Jersey. Excellent. Good to see, good to see you. You know, I spent some time in Jersey. I uh, got to teach at Rutgers for a while and spent lots of time also in a little place called Mountain Lakes. Really love that place. Good to see you. Thanks for saying hello, Sean. So I got some more strategies for you all. Um, let's see here. We've got uh, isolating vocabulary. So one of the number one strategies, on top of all the other ones that are number one and number two and etc., is just to improve your vocabulary. And what better way to improve your vocabulary than to grab words you don't know isolate them and memorize them in a memory palace because reading people are slowed down often because they just don't understand these words right but if you will just take a moment to grab them memorize them then all your reading in the future becomes much more fluid and that's one thing that helps you not only understand more and comprehend more but read faster and comprehend at speed so you've got to know the key terms Again, with the Sanskrit project, understanding this ancient tradition, it's basically a philosophy. Some people say, no, it's not a philosophy. I'm not so sure. I think it's a philosophy. But in any case, I don't really know. It doesn't really matter. Um, what matters is that when I started to isolate the vocabulary, commit it to memory, and then I could just move faster through the text, understand more. And it's really, really important because words and their meaning really matters. And the more that you think about words and get familiar with them and make them a part of your life, the more your joy in language increases and the more you have understanding through this process of joy. So if you never looked into etymology uh, or anything like this, like get into it. It's, it's, it's really, really a great way of understanding language better, learning more, faster, and being more fascinating with words. And, you know, I just, I remember, I have so many fond memories of my Hebrew mentor, Saul, and going on the bus. And he, he used to play this game where um, he would take a word, like, let's just take Mr. Uh, Spaces here, a uh, new comment. He's saying, um, understand, right? So we know what understand means, but what exactly is the under in understand? And what is the stand in understand, right? And then he just picked these words apart and have so much fun. It's like a brain exercise. Oh, so to understand is somehow to be under something and standing up under it, right? It, whether that is what it is or isn't, I don't know. But it's like fun to, th to take that, right? Um, so when you have these portmanteau words or uh, just anything, you can really, really uh, 
pick them apart and and it really makes you more aware of language and more really sensitive to it because you play these games with the words um so you know even something like isolate right now this is a memory tool but you can look at it and just think like what's an iso and what's what's a late in this context or um anything you, you just play this game with anything like understand is a better example because it's actually two words put together but um you can do it with anything and and think about how these words connect and so forth um so that's something i learned from saul physico is in the house good to see you physico Thanks for saying hello. If you're just joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. So isolating vocabulary is really, really important. And, you know, we were on a live stream the other day. What the heck was it? Posterior, superior, parietal lobe I uh, memorized on just right on the live stream. And that's pausing and isolating the vocabulary and memorizing it. And I still have it to this day. And I feel so much more intuitive, intuited uh, or... Uh, integrated with the brain structure. And now it's interesting because I keep hearing it all the time and people use the term different. So sometimes they won't use the word posterior uh, or sometimes they won't use the word um, parietal. I don't know. Like they're, And then I'm like, is that the same structure or what's going on here? Uh, but I'm just noticing it a lot more coming up all the time since I memorized it and just much more integrally associated with this beautiful thing called the brain. So it, it's really, really great. And then you can play that same game, right? So if um, you take a word like uh, parietal, right? It's like, what's the par and what's the ietal? <laughs> and it's just, you can play this game with it. And it really helps. It really helps. All right. So Mr. Space says you still have it because you're the best at it. All right. I'm not sure the context there of what you mean, but... Um, I'm, I'm glad I still have it. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, please say more about what you mean. Now, the other thing is you can memorize dates, names, and terms. And that will help with your comprehension. Because if you have a sense of history, then you're able to make deeper connections with things. You're like, ah, oh, that was in the 18th century in France. Okay, that, that makes sense from what I understand about the 18th century in Germany or in England or whatever. And then you dive even deeper. Oh, it's the year 1600. Interesting. That's when Bruno was uh, sacrificed in Italy. Hmm, that, that's when they say Shakespeare wrote Hamlet, etc. Um, you know, like, there's things to be thought there. And you understand the world better, even if, you're, even if there's nothing to it. Like, there's... There's no evidence that I know of that that um, Hamlet was based on Bruno, but a lot of people have said this, and you can see where they're going and where you're thinking. And when you think about Bruno's character, and when you think about Hamlet's character, you're like, ah, well, yeah, maybe, maybe. I wonder exactly what month <laughs> Shakespeare wrote Hamlet, because if it was before Bruno was burned at the stake, then you know. Maybe not. And, you know, we don't know. We don't know how prevalent Bruno was was known to Shakespeare, or at least I don't know. Um, and maybe we do. So, you know, it's something to go look into. But in any case, that's an example, right, um, of how knowing your history can, or just knowing some dates, can help you give a, a cross-index in your mind of what's happening in different countries, what their, what associations and connections might be there. Same thing with the names of people, the terms, and so forth. So uh, just sticking with Shakespeare, knowing the name Falk Greville, it comes up from time to time in your reading, and uh, it, it's an interesting name to be acquainted with and to have in your memory so that you're much more likely to interact with it and engage with it when it comes up. All right, got some more tips for you. You got to follow up with supplementary material. Always write summaries and always use the magnetic modes. So what does it mean to follow up with supplementary material? Well, it means that you want to have other things that you read. You want to surround the text with paratext. So any book that you read, also read an article. Uh, try to find a podcast if one exists. You'd be amazed. There's podcasts for everything these days. Find some videos on YouTube. Really, really allow yourself to make a phalanx around the text so that you have the text here centrally, and then you have 
another text to the side to support it, another text to the side to support it, in as many mediums as you can so that you really have that piece of material ensconced in a phalanx of knowledge. I'm just using all these uh, big words today, aren't I? I love words. Oh, I can't get enough. Can't get enough. They're very good words. All right. Physico says, I am in doubt. It's best to mind map or use a memory palace to make a summary of a book. I wouldn't use a memory palace to summarize a book at all. Um, I don't know why you would summarize a book with a memory palace. I wouldn't use a mind map to summarize a book either. Um, I would summarize a book in prose and maybe use a mind map to help organize the summary or maybe draw from what I memorized from a book to help write the summary. But I wouldn't use either of those tools directly to make a summary. I would make the summary in writing, in a paragraph, two to three paragraphs actually minimum uh, to get the most out of it. So if you just say, I'm always going to write three paragraphs of summary of what I've read, Great, then you're you're golden. Gonzalo is in the house. Good to see you, Gonzalo. It's been a while. The odd time that I check in on Instagram, I see you on your drums there. Bam, 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 bam. Looks great. Looks great. Gonzalo is in the house. Awesome. Good to see you. That makes me happy. All right, how are you doing? Let me know. So supplementary material. I think that's pretty clear, right? Some sort of audio, some sort of video, some sort of secondary article. As many as you can, actually. This is where you know you can scan and sort and screen and sift and quote unquote speed read um, a lot uh, better uh, because you've read the core text. But then go back and read the core text, right? Another thing about supplementary material is read arguments in favor of it, read criticisms against it, understand more about how it was received in in its historical moment. Even if it's new, there's people commenting on it cross-index what's going on there and really make sure that you get the fullest possible picture. All right. Thanks for those, uh, Gonzalo. I like that. I, I like that clapping square. I don't know what the square means, but it's awesome. Or is that some sort of drum symbol that's not showing up properly? <laughs> great. So yeah, summaries, always write them. It's really, really great. Um, my favorite thing when I was in grad school was to use index cards to write summaries. And for my summaries, what I would do is I would have them on cards bigger than this. I don't have an example card, but this is too small for summaries, but I'd have one of these really big cards, write the summary on there and try to keep it to two to three paragraphs and on both sides of a text. That was very, very powerful. The actual individual notes I might extract would go on a card this size or a little bit bigger. Um, so that's... Uh, very, very good strategy for keeping your summaries all together, stick them in a shoebox or whatever. And then you just can easily go through all the books that you've read and see what you thought about them, see what you summarized from them. Very powerful. Very powerful indeed. All right. So, and then in terms of using the magnetic modes, when you're reading, you really just want to interact with the text and you want to memorize somewhat in real time, which means making sure that you use memory techniques, which is very, very powerful. And uh, obviously, we talk about that in the Magnetic Memory Method universe. So if you don't have the free course, make sure you get that at magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash YT. Jose is in the house, in the memory palace. What recommendations do you have for reading literature passages in standardized tests like the MCAT? Sometimes I struggle to understand dense philosophy passages. Thank you. Great. Okay, so can we get an example of a philosophy passage that might appear in the MCAT? That would be great to see. I'd love to know. And the reason why is because I don't want to just generalize. Let me open up a browser here, see if I can find MCAT philosophy. So I can serve you in a specific way instead of generalize. MCAT. Mm -hmm. Da, 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 MCAT philosophy passages. Wow, look at that, autocomplete. Not sure what I'm going to find here, but um, critical analysis and reasoning skills, practices. Better coming from you, of course, 
uh, if you have something. But um, let's see. Uh, this is just a discuss. Well, I shouldn't say just as if that's a bad thing. This is a discussion forum that I found here. Um, the person here says, I'm going to be reading The Economist and New Yorker in order to get more experience in boring articles. What? What's, what's boring about The New Yorker and The Economist? <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. Oh, yeah, I'm not really finding any like examples of what philosophy looks like in an MCAT, but um, well, let's look up structure, sign, and play in the human discourses. I think that's what it was called by Jacques Derrida. Structure, sign, and play. Oh, sorry. In the human, in the discourses of human sciences. There, there we go. All right. Is it going to give us an actual article? Let's let's try to understand a philosoph philosophical article here. Um, I'm not set up to share my screen. Apologies for that. But. Uh, This is a very, very dense article, and we'll read some of it together. So the first tip there for you, Jose, is to actually read out loud, because I had to read this one out loud to understand what the heck he's talking about. Right. So it's in a book called Writing and Difference, or Difference. And uh, so perhaps something has occurred in the history of the concept of structure that could be called an event. Event. If this loaded word did not entail a meaning, which it is precisely the function of structural or structuralist thought to reduce or to, to suspect. <sighs> it's exciting already. But let me use the term event anyway, employing it with caution and as if in quotation marks. In this sense, this event will have the exterior form of a rupture and a redoubling. So the instant thing here, right? What are we going to pay attention to here? I would pay attention to the first word, perhaps, right? So he's on a he's on uneven footing already. This is an if article, uh, or there's a there's a philosophical tone here. Perhaps something has occurred, right? So I'm thinking, hmm, has he been reading the Communist Manifesto lately? Making a connection in my mind, right? Because what? Uh, how does that text begin, right? <laughs> so perhaps something has occurred in the history of the concept of structure that could be called an event. So immediately, history of the concept of structure, I'm thinking, well, which history, according to whom, and what structure, right? So obviously, this article is assuming a huge amount of pre-existing knowledge. I remember my uh, doctoral supervisor, you know, really, really being annoyed that they would even give people this to read in a second year university course, which is exactly where I got it to read, right? Because already this is assuming so much knowledge of the reader, right? But you coming in cold can ask these questions. Instead of just being like, oh, this is hard or, oh, this is confusing, just say, okay, perhaps. What does perhaps mean? Well, it's a conditional statement. Um, something has occurred in the history of the concept of structure. Well, what concept? What history? Who wrote this history? Right? And then he says that could be called an event in quotation marks. Right? Well, who is calling it this, this event? Right? So already you're building a kind of palette in your mind and you're, you're asking it questions because he's not answering them. He's just babbling on, right? And there's some interesting stuff in this article, if I recall correctly, but um, it's, it, it's not very clear what he's talking about, which history he's talking about. And then he brings in telos and all this kind of stuff. And the structure is in free play and all this sort of thing. And then you just have the title, right? Uh, structure, sign, and play in the discourse of human sciences. So then maybe when you're asking her that question, which concept of structure, maybe he's thinking about human sciences have some kind of structure, etc. So just start asking these questions. It enlivens your mind to the difficulty and starts to pave a path. So in the absence of a specific example from Jose, that's what I got for you. Uh, just an example of the first paragraph here. Hope that helps. Uh, ask more questions if you if you please. Dexter is in the house. Good to see you, Dexter. Struggling with physics theory, it overwhelms me. Well, sorry to hear that. What is it that you're struggling with? Why are you overwhelmed? How can I help? Andres is in the house. Good to see you, Andres. How can you memorize an entire book? Well, 
First of all, you ask yourself, do I have to memorize this book entirely? One of the things that um, one of the things that we have to consider is, do you have to memorize the whole book? Why? In what context would it be useful? You can do it, though. You can do it. So the first thing you're going to need, Andres, is a dedicated, working, functioning memory palace network. Then you're going to need the skills involved in memorizing verbatim. I've done a fair shake of verbatim memorization myself. It is a skill. You can get it. You can do it. But why? Why would you memorize an entire book? There's much, much more efficient means of doing things when it comes to entire book memorization. And you can boil it down to its key points. And if you search up Magnetic Memory Method and how to memorize a textbook, you'll find some training on how to do that. But um, there's very, very very few situations in which it is needed, necessary, warranted, or logical to memorize entire books. But if you have some examples, pop them in. Pop them in. All right. Jose says, I shared a link from Jack Weston. I don't see your link anywhere. Where did that link go, Jose? What's the name of the article from Jack Weston? Maybe tell me the title. I'll just search it up on Google. Andre says, good answer. Awesome. If you're just joining us, hit that thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking, how things are for you. We are chatting about reading comprehension, how to improve it. Jose says there's a link from Jack Weston we can look at. And uh, Dexter is overwhelmed with physics theory. I'd like to know more about why and see what we can do to help you. One thing we can do is for you to join our webinar and you can do that by going to magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash SRF. Let me share that with you in the chat. And what you'll do is go to this page here and you'll click register now. And when you click register now, you'll see this page and you just put your information and join us. It's going to be a lot of fun. All right. So you are saying Jack Weston has daily practice on the MCAT, daily passages. All right, Jack Weston daily passages. Let's look that up. And let me know specifically, what is your problem? I'm not, I, I'm not sure, you know, you just say recommendations. What is the problem? So I have cars, daily passages, MCAT cars, tutoring with Jack Weston. I'm not sure um, what exactly to look at here. He's got one of these super simplified websites that um, aren't really showing me what it is, this daily, daily reading. So I'm going to need a specific link to find uh, philosophical passages there. Wow, this is making boring, making for boring viewing. I wish that you could just uh, copy and paste in a passage so we could look at it. That would uh, make it a lot easier. But the, the basic thing is, first of all, uh, Jose is to go and watch this replay from beginning to end. It will share with you, um, it will share with you what I would suggest that you do. Um, and I think you'll find it very, very uh, powerful because we covered that today. And, uh, You're using your phone. Well, that's not a good way to learn. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to chastise, but um, anytime people are using their phone, they're um, signaling to the universe and to the robots bad signals. We need to learn on tools that actually help us learn. Uh, go under practice. I don't see practice here anywhere. I see cars practice but I don't see anything explicitly practice. So you're going to have to copy and paste something regardless of whether you're on your phone or not. The thing is, is here's how you read. You schedule time to read. You read every single word on the page after you prime. If you're reading online, you're just shooting yourself in the head and the foot and the belly and the chest all at the same time because reading online is not reading. It's not real reading. I don't think so at all, not for a second. Do I do it from time to time? Yes, but it's not real reading. 
What I prefer to do is print things out and read them. I don't consider it read if it's not printed out. It's just screen read. We need a new word, screen read, screen reading. It's not effective. Um, so don't, uh, you know, print it out, print it out. That's going to be the number one thing. And here's the thing. I don't know how your test is, but if you're practicing reading on screens and then all of a sudden you go to a test and you're reading from paper and you're like trying to comprehend it, your eyes are completely rewired for uh, screen reading, which is reading that trains you to skip all over the place, um, to scan, to graze. That's not reading. Uh, it isn't at all. So you've got to, um, you've got to read properly. So if uh, your daily reading from Jack Weston here, if he doesn't have explicit instructions on how to use a printer, I'd be suspicious about this beautiful looking website that is very beautiful, but I can't find anything on it. So the beauty, the beauty is, is great. <laughs> All right. So that's how you do it. You print stuff out. And Dexter says, with physics, particularly is like my brain is foggy and cannot concentrate for more than 15 minutes. Great. So Dexter, do you, do you sleep properly? Do you eat properly? Are you at the gym? I was at the gym this morning. Didn't feel like going. I went anyway. Um, that's good for your brain. If you're eating, if you're eating food, I, I'm not going to go through all kinds of dietary advice. You can go to magneticmerrymethod.com. Foods that improve memory. Look at that. You can read my upcoming book, which hopefully will be out in a couple months or sooner. And it talks all about creating proper diets for yourself. That'll help with brain fog. Chances are it's sleep and diet and lack of exercise that is making your brain foggy. And lack of proper brain training. So can you use a memory palace? And can you use it effectively do you meditate? You know, the usual common sense stuff. If uh, you're having brain fog, then you really need to look into it. And have you been to a doctor to rule out any um, condition? That, that it's possible that there's some kind of condition. So going to see a doctor is good practice. Highly recommended. Uh, you know, make sure your blood is okay and that your lungs are okay, etc. People don't check in with that stuff enough. And it's very, very critical to doing so. So Jose, I'm sorry if I won't let you share the link. I'm not seeing that. Usually when people want to share a link, it just asks me to approve it. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know what that what that issue is. But you can also just search for something and share the search term that you that you found. Um, but the key point is, Find something to read, practice reading it offline, make sure you know how to prime, make sure you follow all the tips that we talked about in this, um, in this live stream, and you can go back and watch the replay if you like, or you can wait, eventually I'll make a podcast and blog post version of this. If you're subscribed at magneticmerrymethod.com, then you'll get that uh, mailed to you, express through the airwaves. Then I suggest you print it out and read it. All right. Andre says, how can I memorize concepts, law concepts? Give me a law concept in the chat. Otherwise, we can only just generalize. The answer is make sure you take the free course and uh, learn how to use mnemonics. There is no information that is special or somehow more difficult than anything. So give me some law concepts to, to talk about. Um, are you sure, uh, Jose, that you can't just uh, copy and paste a specific example into here? We could spend all day trying to find your uh, something from Jack Weston. I have no idea anything about uh, the cars thing that he's talking about here. And his website is not showing up very well for me. And I have no idea what it is. Well, his website just took over my uh, screen here. So I'm not going to be able to do that for you. If you can't uh, copy and paste something in there, then... I'm not sure what we're going to do, but his website behaves very, very strange. All right. So Andre says, which are the best habits for life? So, well, 
Dexter apparently has some. He eats well. He exercises regularly. He meditates. When you say that you eat well, Dexter, what does that mean? Um, but so best habits for life. I would first say, Andres, you want to look at yourself and say, what are the bad habits that I know need to be changed? Start with that. Then think about making it a habit to get rid of the bad habits. So best is a bad word. It's a tricky word. I mean, it's not a bad word in and of itself, but when people want to know the best of things, no, I don't, I don't know. What, what we got to start with is what are the bad habits that you have that need to be changed? Think about that. Create a list. Share it with us if you like. Uh, if not, then don't, but think of it privately. Then pick the one that you think you could change. Pick the one that you think you could actually change and then start to craft a plan for changing it and develop the skill of habit change so that then you could pick the next toughest one and start to change that after you've had success changing the first one. Does that make sense, Andres? I think that's a better thing than thinking about what are the best habits. The best habits for me may not be the best habits for you. So for example, one of my best habits is to get up and write 2,000 words every morning. Well, it's the best habit for me, but is that a best habit for you? Probably not. I mean, I think anybody would benefit from doing daily writing, but uh, 2,000 words? Even 2,000 words can become a barrier and an obstacle, and I've changed that number from time to time. Sometimes it's not best for me to write at all in the morning. Sometimes it's best to write in the evening. So avoid the word best. That's a good habit. <laughs> and figure out for you, what are the barriers? What are the obstacles? Okay, so Dexter, good about avoiding junk food, but then what fruit and vegetables? Have you ever gone and done an elimination diet? It could be that the fruit and vegetables are creating um, uh, inflammation in your brain and you're not even aware of it because you could have sensitivities to those. Avoiding junk food is very, very good. Very, very good. But it's not necessarily the case that just eating fruit and vegetables is going to be good for you, right? Because I used to think this and I created a lot of pain and suffering for myself because when they thought I had gout, they gave me a Mediterranean diet filled with nightshades that was creating more pain and making me get fatter and fatter and fatter and inflammation in the brain, surely, and uh, causing more confusion. And I was just like, why, why am I not getting better? It's because of fruits and vegetables. <laughs> so maybe that's what you got to focus on. You, you might be eating very healthy, but it can be that those foods are filled with toxins to you that you're very sensitive to. So this is why in my new book, you're going to learn about an elimination diet. You're going to learn about a rotation diet that'll help you figure that out. Um, because that can be the thing that's that's got you in its grip. Eating fruits and vegetables is not necessarily a healthy diet. Just because, but you would think that it is, but not necessarily. It's very, very important to look into that. <clears throat> jo Jose says, what type of meditation, meditation do you recommend? Well, it's the same sort of principle as with um, Andres. It's like meditation or like, you know, best meditation or whatever. No, there's, there's, it's, it, we got to change that word meditation to meditations because there's many, many different kinds. So the first thing that I recommend is understand that there are many kinds of meditation and that you need to explore a number of them and continue to explore over time. So I recommend all of, all the kinds of meditation on a rotation and try and do as many as you can. So what are some of the kinds? Well, there's sitting just to sit. There's breathing meditation. There's chanting meditation. There are all kinds of physical movement meditations. There's walking meditation. There is um, something called karma yoga, which is really a complicated one in one hand, but very, very simple in the other, which is just constantly letting go of the need for any result to the actions, just doing actions without needing a needing a, a reward or not caring for the for the consequences um, uh, or for anything that you might receive, um, 
and just really, really practicing that as a daily meditation. Um, there's bhakti de- uh, meditation and so forth. Um, anything that is tuning your mind is great. It's, it, it's, really, it's really great, provided that you're realistic about the science. The other thing to know about meditation is that it's very, very unlikely to have an effect if you don't do it at least four times a week. And yeah, it's also, you want to combine multiple kinds of meditation. And the other thing too is I would suggest that everybody place their meditations efforts, the multiple meditation efforts inside of a larger goal so that as you proceed, you have something to track your progress against, Um, which is kind of weird, right? Because I just talked about karma yoga, which is a contradiction. If you don't, if you aren't concerned about getting anything in return for what you do, why would you have a goal? It is a contradiction, but it actually makes sense because your goal, and one of those goals, is to be free from any concern of the consequences of actions and to be free of likes and dislikes and so forth. So it's kind of a it's kind of a weird thing, but it totally makes sense if you think it through. You can have that goal because that is ultimately having liberation from your ego. And uh, I think that's a pretty fair goal. I don't mean get rid of your ego, but to be liberated from your ego. And so many meditations can get you there. Dexter says, what a contradiction. Yeah, I'm not the only person, though, that has discovered this in my own practice. And there's great science. Um, There's a great presentation on the internet that uh, I came across one time. I should have memorized it because I I, I could probably find it again. Um, But in it, the presenter was talking about how broccoli has a lot of toxins in it. And when you heat it up, it actually creates more toxin. And some people are super sensitive to that, to that toxin. Um, So that's pretty crazy. Uh, And you'd think broccoli. Wow. And one of the things that she talks about in this presentation is is how um, very, very little scientific evidence exists that fruits and vegetables are actually healthy for us. We just sort of take that for granted. I don't know uh, about her accuracy, but there it is. Um, She has this wonderful presentation about that, and you can check it out. All right. So, sorry I couldn't help you out there, Jose, with um, your MCAT procedures with an example but his website shoots up all kinds of stuff all over the screen um and i can't quite uh, quite see it um but in any case reading is what we talked about today went through a number of suggestions for you all and for more on reading join us for our webinar at magneticmarymethod.com forward slash srf and we are going to talk a lot more about reading And what you do is you go to that link, and I'll share it with you all here in the YouTube chat. Um, Once I grab it again, somehow I got MCAT on my (laughs) copy-paste. So grab hold of that, join us. What you'll do is go to this page, click the Register Now button, then you'll see this and it will uh, show up for you and just put your information in there and away you go. Now then, on to the thank yous to everybody. I want to thank Barry, as always, for grabbing a cup to support the show and uh, sending me his pick. If you don't have one, you can always go and get some swag at magneticmarymethod.com forward slash swag. Send me your image and I will, I will uh, send you a very, very special free training video that only people with the swag get. Always awesome. Thanks to Paul for grabbing one of these. If you want one, make sure you get one before all the print copies are gone. Let me know if you want it signed. That's at magneticmarymethod.com forward slash TMC. Thanks to Adolfo. He's got his cup there. Christian's got a shirt. There's Mohammed, awesome, and Marichella. Always love seeing the Magnetic Mary Method Cup out in the community, and thank you so much, everybody, for supporting the work. Seven is in the house. Sorry you missed this, but enjoy the replay. 
If you're just joining us, I'll stick around for another minute or two. Uh, but if you have questions, I'd love to answer them. But I'm going to call it a day here in a second. Join us for our webinar at magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash SRF speed reading fundamentals. Jonathan and I are going to have a blast helping you out with that. Look forward to seeing you there. And uh, reading comprehension is something everybody can really, really benefit from. Everybody can increase. You know, you don't have to worry about where you are right now. You can hit the ground running and um, you can start to develop your comprehension over time. I'm always working to increase my comprehension. I remember seeing Scott Young there uh, on a, a live stream where he's teaching himself all kinds of far out math and uh, really, really enjoyed having a look at that. And I pushed myself that way with, with Sanskrit. I mean, it was really hard slog in the beginning because there's all these new terms, new concepts and so forth. And as I continued to read and continued to persist and memorize information from the tradition I was looking at, then I could snap it on and connect it with so many other traditions that I, that I knew. Um, and have this plump, robust image show up. And then I started to read more about other traditions. And it's a great, um, it's a great project, a great learning project to continue to challenge yourself and to be able to do it quickly. So we want you to also join this webinar and make sure that you get these skills and, and have the opportunity to see it from different perspectives which is why Jonathan and I are doing this together. So you see it from the super learner perspective and really going to enjoy uh, being there with you all today. So Andre says, cool cup. Awesome. Thanks for noticing that. Mr. Space wants a cup too. Awesome. Grab it. And I will send you a uh, special video when I see you with your pick. Yeah. And uh, yeah, cups are cool. I got a cup here from YouTube. <laughs> pew, pew, pew. Anybody watch that? Awesome. Jose asks, is tomorrow's webinar different than today's? Um, yeah, it's very, very different. It's actually mostly presented by Jonathan Levy from a different angle, a different take. So please make sure that you register and that you're there. If you want the replay, make sure you're there at magneticmarymethod.com forward slash SRF. If you miss it, then that's it because we only do this every so often and we actually haven't done one for a number of years. <laughs> it's kind of, a, he was telling me, he was like, why haven't we done this earlier? Oh, I don't know. Um, busy, been busy. Uh, but obviously it's a great thing when the two of us get together. So many people have both Super Learner and the Magnetic Mary Method and we're able, we're just overjoyed that we're able to help so many people together. And uh, yes, it's different, fresh, unique, new, you're going to love it, Jose. Make sure to register. Seving says he will ask any questions through the replay. Awesome, awesome. That is great. Okay, well, if uh, there are no other questions, let's call it a day. I really, really enjoyed speaking about some strategies to improve reading comprehension with you all today. Just to sum up, go and read more. Read more, schedule your reading, and you will have a benefit just from that, just from that alone. Jose says he'll be at work tomorrow. Will there be a recording? Yes. If you register, you will get the recording. If you do not register, you will not. Um, so please make sure to register, even if you can't be there so you can get the replay. And um, it is going to be a wonderful, wonderful session. And we will encourage you to read more, read more often. And Again, one of the benefits of being there is that we don't necessarily have the same uh, ideas and views and experiences, so you get to learn about these techniques from a different perspective, which is a lot of fun. All right. Thank you once again, everybody, for being here today. Always appreciate being able to hang out in these live streams. Thanks for making it active and interesting and fun. And as I always like to say, until we have a chance to speak again. Awesome, Jose. Thanks for registering. If you're listening to this and you haven't registered yet, hop to it. Let me get you that link into the chatty chat one last time because I'm off to go keep myself magnetic. I got a lot of reading to do today myself. I love to just sit and read 
and bask in the glory of not only just reading, but being able to remember what I read, because that is the most exciting thing in the world. And you're very welcome for the motivation, Mr. Space. Thank you for being active in the chat. Thank you for motivating me, because the more active you all are in the chat, the more motivated I am to continue doing this. The more thumbs up you give, the more people who subscribe, then obviously that helps keep this going. So if you care about free education on the internet, then be active, be engaged, because the robots and the corporate suits and ties, they're going to take it all away if we don't show them consistently and persistently that we care about free, meaningful education on the internet. And if they don't take it away, they're going to corporatize it. And uh, just it's getting wild and strange. And we need to together show the machines and the people who design and organize and read the data and pivot based on what they're seeing. We need to show them that we care about this. So yeah, thumbs up to that and subscribe to this channel if you aren't already subscribed. I'm so glad to hear that I'm helping your life, Mr. Space. Let's keep that going and uh, let me know more about how I can help in the future. If you have ideas for future live streams, let me hear them loud and clear. And I thank you all again. Till we have a chance to speak again, Thanks, and keep yourself magnetic. Bye-bye.